Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you came to see Will, you are so disappointed. I'm the. I'm going to be speaking this morning. Will Will is away, and uh, Will and I have a really good communication between us. And uh, when he 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 thought, let's do this series for, called the Summer Series, the Summer Playlist. Sorry, a series of Psalms out of Psalms. Um, and he he said, hey. Should we do this, you know, and uh, hey, I'm all for whatever. And uh, the idea is that he, he does most of the teaching and um, when he gets it wrong, I have to put him right. No, it's not. It's not. It's not really. But um, so it, he started two weeks ago. Um, he started with Psalm 1. He was due to do Psalm 2 last week, but then he changed it all and did something else. And so this week we were talking, Will and I, I'm just sort of putting you a bit of background here, and he said, um, oh, he said, what was you going to do? He said, was you going to do Psalm 2? Or I said, no, that was, you were doing that. So I said, no, I'll just leave it at Psalm 3. I said, and when you come back, you'll just do Psalm 2. Just jumble it around. It'll keep everyone on their toes. Anyway, we are going to go into Psalm 3. Um, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> I'm going to pray, and then it will come up that uh, the whole of Psalm 3, actually, has only eight verses, so we're going to put all eight verses up there. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I bless and thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our days. And Lord, I want to ask now, Father, I, I just know in my life, Lord, how dependent I am upon you. And Father God, I pray, Lord, that as come to preach your word i pray lord that hearts would be open you'd give understanding to each and every one of us lord i thank you that your love is is beyond anything that i could speak about this day but lord i thank you that you love each and every one of us so much and i pray lord that this word is going to be a word to encourage to edify to build up and in some cases lord maybe it to pull down some areas in people's lives i ask lord that you would set a guard on my lips that nothing more than you would have for us would come forth nor a word short heavenly father i pray these things in and through the our savior's precious and holy name jesus christ amen okay so oh can we oh there there we go it is coming up psalm one uh, sorry psalm three starting at verse one we're going to read all of it i'm going to read it you can read along if you want but uh do it under your breath, otherwise it's going to, if you don't keep up with me or I'll get a hug behind you, it'll, it'll be terrible. Okay, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, although tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me. My God, strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be upon your people. Amen. Okay, so I, I read that on purpose because I don't want you saying to Will, hey, Will, Dave was preaching on Psalm 3, but he didn't preach much about it. So now you can say, hey, we read all of Psalm 3. I want to start by giving you a little bit of a background. I, I have a mind that uh, is a very inquisitive mind, so uh, very often I will ask the Lord things, and I'll say, I don't understand why this and why that. And so... Uh, I, I, years ago, I did this with a book of Psalms. There was many things that confused me, and I wanted the Lord to give me some clarity. So this is what I, I, I'm hoping that the teaching I'm going to bring about this before we get into Psalm 3 is going to help you. Okay? Um, many of the books that we read, whether they're secular books or books from the Bible or even the book of Psalms, uh, always seem to follow the same pattern. There's the beginning, 
the middle and the end. We're so used to that. In other words, the start of the story, the middle part of the story, and then the conclusion of the story. And I, I think that is a pattern we, we can understand. You know, children are born, they're young, they grow, they get older, they go teenagers, blah de blah until they pass on and they die. And so, but the book of Psalms doesn't seem to be like that. And I used to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm not understanding, why doesn't, why isn't the first psalm that was written first and the last psalm that was written last? Why, why do we jump around so much? Well, there is a reason for that, and I want to give you a little bit of history about this. We are getting into Psalm 3, I promise you. But it, the, the, the history starts, you haven't got to turn this in your Bible, but in 2 Chronicles, in, in chapter 36 it is, uh, you'll read about Nebuchadnezzar. Ne Nebuchadnezzar was an evil king. He wasn't a very good king. He was very much against the Jews. And when he came, he sacked everything that the Jews had. He took everything. He took all their books, their manuscripts. He, he burnt them all. He, uh, he took their jewels. They took the, the sacred things of the temple, their iron, copper, brass, gold, the whole lot. He took out of it. Now, the Jews didn't have much of a Bible anyway. They're not like you. They've got 66 books. It consisted of three, uh, sorry, uh, five books. Okay, we know these ones. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, that was their Bible. But it all got wiped away. Everything had been destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed everything. And I don't know about you, but if I... If someone asked me, well, not me so much, because, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a plant, a, I've been supplanted into this nation, but, okay, let's think. Uh, I'm going to pick on you. Thank you. Right, I, if you'd been asked to write the history of this nation, I wonder what you would actually write down. I mean, you'd heard stories about the nation, but whether you could remember it or not, so this is the situation that we get after Nebuchadnezzar had left. And then, we're then in the book of Ezra. Ezra, by the way, was a scribe and he was a priest. But Bre Ezra was a very talented man, but he was also a very God-inspired man. And God called Ezra to actually write what was in the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus... Numbers, Deuteronomy. I don't know if I could have done that. Well, I know I couldn't have done it. I, I don't know how many times I've actually read the Bible from beginning to end, you know, and from maps backwards to the introductions, everything. But if you ask me to sit down and write one of those books, I think I'd be a little bit hard-pressed. And this is what Ezra's task was, and God blessed him and, uh, and he, he, he wrote, so when they came, the Jews, is that for me? <laughs> it, when he was called to, to write this, God anointed him really to do it. And it was a miracle really that they were actually back in Jerusalem because Nebuchadnezzar never wanted to, to have people the Jews especially, it was his desire that they would eradicate it, to get rid of. But by the time that, that this ha all happened, he, he had gone on to glory, or not to glory, but he died, and other kings had come, and Darius was the king, and Darius was another man who hated the Jews, and you would have thought that Darius would have said, you're not going to do anything. But he didn't. I, I, he, it says that God stirred him. And I think at times God uses the evil people to do things for our benefit. That's a strange thing to say, but I'll explain a bit more about that a bit later. Anyway, he said to the Jews, look, if you don't want to be here, you can go off. You can go back to your, your own land. And some of them did, and one of them was Ezra, and so Ezra was given the task of writing, because they had to have their writings back, and he, he, re, he wrote down what we see as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or the Pentateuch, as we'd call it. And 
I remember asking the Lord years and years ago. I used to, to teach at a Bible college. And one of the things that I taught was Psalms. Now, I, I remember saying to God, I don't understand why it doesn't start with the early, uh, first Psalm and finish with the last Psalm. And then I begin to realize if you've got a modern translation, it probably won't show it in your Bible, but King James, New, New International Version, all of those, they, they, they will have the Psalms broken up and it'll say book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. And this is what Ezra had written, book one, two, three, four, five. And book one was mirrored to Genesis. Psalms 1 to 41, the theme of it is the sovereignty of God, if you read those Psalms. The next set is Psalm set 2, which is from Psalms 42 to 72, and it speaks about the, the, the redemption of God. And if you think about Exodus, the way God had redeemed the children of Israel and took them out of captivity, then you realize the Psalms in, in that bracket tend to very much reflect that. The third set was Psalm 73 to 89, and this speaks about the sanctuary of God. And if you look and you read those Psalms, you'll see it talked very much about how the, the, you know, the, the sanctuary was and how we were to approach the God in the sanctuary. And so that speaks of the sanctuary. The, the fourth Psalms 90 to 106 speaks about Israel's history. And that mirrors with the book of Numbers. That's very much the book of history, what happened with them. And the last, the fifth set, is Psalms 107 to 159. Is the theme of those is the word of God. And I hope this is going to bring a little bit more understanding of why the Psalms are, they are. They seem jumbled up, but they were jumbled up for a reason. And they fell into a categories, and that's why they were put in that category. And we said that, we get to Psalm 3, okay? And it starts off, David starts off with this cry, How many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many of them are saying, God will not deliver him. So I'd like to just mention <laughs> another, just come, another thing about the book of Psalms, by the way. You know, in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 26, it speaks about uh, Jesus was doing the bread, uh, bread and the wine. He was explaining about what he had done for them, which we get our communion from. But that finishes, he finishes there. And the next thing that happens is they all leave there and they go up to the Mount of Olives, but not before, it says, they sung a psalm. And I used to, I used to going back, I used to think, I wonder what psalm that was. Do you ever sort of get like that? What, what psalm would Jesus have sung? Can you imagine him singing? I bet he didn't have a voice like mine. <laughs> no, serious. I, I'm not a very good singer. I just get enthusiastic about singing. I feel sorry for Paul or whoever's leading at the time because I'm very vocal and, and, and very animated in the way I, I sing. I use my hands to sing. Some of you are the same, others not, but that's good. But how would Jesus have sung? But reading historians and theologians, uh, and they pretty much say this is the, the psalm that Jesus would have sung on that occasion. Yeah, Ooh, I'm le learning something. He would have sung Psalm 118, and it was a, song, a psalm of ascension. They, the, the, the Jews sang this when they went going up to the temple to worship, to give their sacrifices, and it would have been Psalm 118. And when I found that out years ago, I used to get excited because there, there are so many s choruses, can't call them hymns really, because we, used, we went from hymns to singing choruses in those days. We sing very few hymns now, really. Um, but we used to sing so many from Psalm 118, one especially, which you're bound to have sung if you've been in church for any length of time. And it goes, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. 
We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. And we used to do it with vigor and vim, and we'd clap our hands and we'd get excited. And I'd think, wow, Jesus sang this, and now I'm singing it. <laughs> Probably sounded a lot different to God. But think about this just for a moment. When Jesus was singing it, he knew what was going to happen next. This is the day the Lord has made I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. He knew that he was going to be sacrificed on a cross. That was the next step that was going to happen. He was going to be arrested, tried, and then crucified. I think the Psalms have so much that they can teach us. Now, this isn't from a theologian. This isn't from any history but it's just something I always used to think because I, I thought this would be quite amusing for if it was me. Do you remember when David was brought before Saul because Saul had this evil spirit and he was called to play his music and, and just sing to him and calm him down, right? I think if I was David, I think I'd have probably been singing Psalm 8. This is the psalm where David had just defeated Goliath. Can you imagine singing that? There is Saul, really going through it. This is a good song. I defeated the giant. He is now gone. I chopped his head off. Ha, ha, ha. You know, <laughs> I don't know whether David would have done that, but I think I might have been inclined to have done it. I think I might have been inclined to have made up a tune that would have been really good, that would have gone with that psalm. And that would have reminded Saul, he was probably a lot better than me, David. Well, he was a lot better than me. But anyway, back to Psalm 3. We, uh, you see, now we are going to get into Psalm 3. Psalm 3, we know that was, this was written by David. This was the first psalm that had an inscription on it. In other words, it tells us who wrote it, Okay. But it's called a psalm of lament. It's a sorrowful psalm. It starts off, and David at this time is, is on the run. He's escaping from the, the situations he had left behind him. He was being cast out. Um, and there was many things that happened that David brought upon himself. Unfortunately, in life, we do do things that do come back to haunt us at times. The thing I love about this psalm David was able to look at the situation and say, this is a horrible situation to be in, and I don't know what I can do about it. But then David pulls himself together, but he says, but my God, my God will never leave me nor forsake me. My God is faithful to me, and I'm going to trust in my God. I don't know what you are going through at the moment. I do know this, that if you're going through a situation, it's never cheers people up to say to them oh come on think about so and so he's got it worse than you that really doesn't make a lot of difference if you're going through a situation it's very difficult to see the bright side of something you know it doesn't make a lot of difference to you if you're going through something for someone to say well at least the putsy's going up you know or the the the, the you know the stock exchange you know the dollar is getting worth more or something, or the, the, the shares are beginning to... That doesn't cheer you up if you've got a health issue that you're going through. So where do you get cheered up from? I, I, I do my best to cheer people up when they're in a situation, not by singing them a song, by the way, or, or going in and thinking, oh, come on, forget about that. There's good things that are happening. Sometimes people need someone just to sit with them and put their arm around them and just to be a comfort to them. I think as Christians, we have a, a, a tremendous gifting that we have that we can pray for people. I don't know about you, but I, I believe prayer is so important and I believe we should be people of prayer. I think... I think we can encourage more than anything else by praying. I don't know about you, but there are times that I, someone just sent me a note and said, I don't know why, but I just feel that 
God has called me to be praying for you at this time. They don't say because of they think I'm going through something. But God reminds us, and I do that a lot. I, I'll, I'll write to people, I'll send them a little memo or something and say, hey, just remember, you've got people praying for you. I say this very often, and I, I pray that you would know it. There is not a person in our church that I do not pray for every day. So if you think, well, no one's thinking about me today, I'm praying for you. And not just I, but I know our leadership prays for you. I know many people in our church who are phenomenal prayer warriors are praying about situations that involve you. You may not even know it, but God is hearing that prayers. Okay? Now, David had known what it was to be successful. He'd come up from being a shepherd boy. He'd become the king. He was in the, you know, so success wasn't new to him. He, he, he was ruling and reigning, but he also knew sorrow. He knew what it was to, to sort of party, and he knew what it was to, to, to be sorrowful. I asked this question in the church this morning. I did say, I don't want people to share out the answer. And there's two reasons I, I'm, not asking you to, I'm asking you not to. It's one, if you get the right answer, you're gonna th I'm going to think, oh, thank you, that stole my thunder on that. And if you get the wrong answer, then everyone's going to look at you and think, what an idiot. I'm pleased I didn't say that. So I'm sparing you from things, and I'm trying to spare something from me, okay? This is the question. What is the only thing in the natural world that goes up a hill faster than it comes down? It goes up a hill faster than it comes down. I'll give you the answer. It's fire. Yeah, fire goes up quicker and it comes down. And that was really sort of, I, I read this um, ooh, a few years ago, but in 1994, in California, in, in Colorado it was, they had a terrible fire that was going on. It went on for three days, and it, it was just after three days, they believed that they had got it under control. They believed that they'd got fire under control, and there was a group of 24 firemen. They, they were up on a mount mountain, and down in the, the, uh, the, uh, the bottom of the... It, it was like in a bowl, it was, uh, in a canyon. And all of a sudden, the wind picked up, and it took that fire that was in the canyon, whew, and it took the fire straight up the mountain. All 24 died. That's a terrible story. But I'm telling you that because fire has a way of burning things up in our lives. I said this this morning early in the early meeting, and I'm going to say it to you now. And it's nothing really to do with the psalm, but I found it very relevant. I don't know about you, and I don't know about, I'm not getting into politics or things such as that, I promise, but over the last least year, probably two years, I've really found something that has upset me, really. And I, and I speak to the Lord about it, and I say, God, I, I, I'm just finding this so upsetting that the world, that a group of the, in the world have taken a covenant of uh, my God and they've twisted it and turned it for their benefit. Do you remember in Genesis 9 where it's, it talks about that God flooded the earth and when, uh, when Jonah, Jonah, Sorry about that, Noah. Um, Noah comes out and, and God says, I'm, I'm going to make a covenant with you and all mankind. I'm never going to flood the world again. And you just look in the sky and I'm going to put my bow, my rainbow there. And you're going to know this is my covenant with you. And I said, Lord, I think these people who I think are ungodly have taken a covenant of God, a symbol of a covenant, and they've used it and now it, it just takes on a whole different meaning. No one looks and says, ah, oh, that, that's God telling us that he's never going to flood the earth again. And I, and I think they're using it. And I, and I said, God, I, 
that upsets me. And it does. It, I, inside, that, that used to get to me so much. And as I was sort of like last week or the week before it was when I was thinking about this word and I, it, I come up about this fire and I thought God you know and then I'm thinking about the this covenant and God reminded me the first covenant that God gave mankind really was the rainbow but God said I'm going to give you a second covenant and it's going to be the last covenant and it says in Revelations 20 all the ungodly are going to be cast into the fire. And that fire will be of God. And that fire will bring judgment. And it reminds me so much that there are times when we allow a little spark to come into our life and the damage it can do and how much it can cause. You know, David was able to say, many, everyone's against me, many are against me. And it was a consequence, really, the psalm, uh, Psalm 3, is a consequence of David's failure. And David's failure started way back when David was on his balcony one night and he looks across at the balcony next to him and there is Bathsheba who is naked and bathing and instead of just walking the other way, David looked at her and looked at her and he allowed lust to come into his heart and from that lust, it brought even greater sins to happen. It caused David to start lying. It caused David to find out that her husband, good man, needed to be got rid of so he could make a free pass. Because Bathsheba was pregnant and he, he, he didn't want to take the blame in that way. So he had him killed. So from just looking comes lying, comes murder. And later in, in, in David's life, a prophet called Nathan said to David, I'm going to, David, you're, you've brought, brought a lot of things upon yourself uh, and I'm going to remind you of some of them. And he reminds David of all that happened. Uh, and he reminded him of, of looking the way he did. He reminded him of the, putting the, the, her husband to death. And he says there, there can be consequences you didn't realize, but that's going to affect your whole family. And if you look, David's family was so affected by the sins that David had brought into the family. He, he had a son who lusted after his sister and, and, and a, sexually assaulted her, which caused one of the brothers... Absalom to be so angry with Amon that he, he went out and killed him and from there Absalom thought I could do a better job than my father and so Absalom declared war against David all these things happened because of David's sin at the beginning and how it had grown and I think so often we do things that unless we get them dealt with they just come back to haunt us I've written something down, which uh, I, I don't know if I, 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 I don't think I ever thought of this, but I think I know I read it, and I thought how good it was. It says, sin always takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay, and it costs you more than you want to pay. For David, it cost him everything. It cost him the throne, it cost him his family, it cost him, he lost a child, he lost, it just was so much. And so when David's out and he's writing this Psalm 3 and he's not writing it in a palace or in a comfy place, he's writing it under the stars and, it, and he's writing about the things that he had done. I don't know about you, but there, are, there have been times in my life that I know that if I don't deal with something, it's going to come back and haunt me. I love Will. He's a very, very, very close brother of mine. And we have no secrets. And I say that openly. We have no secrets. I don't think there's a thing that I don't know about Will's life or he doesn't know about my life. 
And we're both able to know these things and know that we've been forgiven and we encourage each other to know that as forgi forgiveness of God just surpasses everything else. Think about this. How many times can you repent of a sin? I don't just mean say, oh, I'm sorry, but repent. True, you know what true repentance is? It means you say, God, I'm so sorry, and I don't want to ever do that again. I'm going to do everything I can not to, and I'm going to ask you to help me not to do this thing again. That's true repentance, to turn the other way. How many times you, can you repent of a sin? Once. You know why I say that? Because God says, I forgive you, and I'm going to put that as far as the east is from the west. The trouble is, we so often remember it, and very often we go through th things that happen in our life, and we constantly think about them, and we constantly have our mind, you know, just, I'm never going to... I'm never going to amount to much. No one's going to like me. No one's going to love me because of these things. Uh, and we think that, that there is no forgiveness in God. Well, we hope there is. And we hope that God forgives. I want to give you some good news today. I believe that my God is a God who forgives and forgets. He said, I'm going to put your sins as far as the east is from the west. We struggle at times, though. We struggle, I think, because we're our own worst enemy. We are. We're our own worst enemy at times. We have an enemy, by the way, that whispers in our ear things. He said, what about if Jim found out about this, about your life? I say, well, I just pray that Jim loves me enough to say, Hey, that was in the past. You're forgiven. Yeah, but that doesn't work like that, Lord. What works like, if Jim knows about it, he's going to tell everyone in this room about it. And that's how I'm going to feel. Oh, I'm just a nobody. I love what God has done for me in my life. Paul said this. Paul said, of all the sinners in the world, of all the sinners, I'm the worst one. I'm the greatest of all sinners. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel, man, I've blown it so badly. I've blown it so badly that I could never come back from this. David was in a situation where he looked and said, everyone's turned against me. And people do turn against you very easily, but God never will. In Psalm, uh, sorry, Psalm 3, in 3 and 4 it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield to me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. What a good contrast between verses 1 and 2 to get into 3 and 4. We, we're in that place where, yeah, I know I'm doing wrong. I know I've done wrong. I know I've blown it. I know that, you know, in the world, the world will never forget. But God, I've got you in my side. I've got you who loves me. You said you'll never forsake me. I think there are times we need protecting from ourselves, protection from the way that we think, because we have this tendency constantly of looking at the bad things in our life. That not so bad at times, in as much as if you don't dwell on them, it's a good deterrent that we think, I remember the last time, I remember what happened the last time. I was uh, blessed yesterday. I took a, a wedding of a man and a woman, obviously. That's the only weddings I take, by the way. You know, if you want me to do another type of wedding, I, I, I don't do them. But, uh, and it's no secret, both of these men and a woman have been married previously. And both of them had many hurts from those.
and talking with them prior to it. There were many things that they wondered about. Will I be the same person? Will I get hurt again? Will they treat me like they, the other person treated me? I'm frightened of going into this commitment because I don't want to be hurt. Do you know, I, I, I think our God is so great. And he's such a healer. And I want to say this to you today. I don't know your situations. I don't know where you've come from or where you're at at the moment. But I'm going to tell you, my God gives new starts and new beginnings. And God is able to give you beauty for ashes. He really is. And I, I'm saying this to you because I believe this is what God is calling me to tell you at this moment. This isn't a made-up sermon that, that I, I'm just making up to, to sound good or that's been prepared. I'm feeling that God is saying, you are forgiven. I'm, I'm giving you a new beginning. I'm going to heal the hurts that are in your heart. And if you allow me to, I, I will bring a healing that you didn't think was possible. We all have things from the past that we carry. And you have to learn how to give them to the Lord. You have to learn how to walk in a new way. And that's not in the old way, but a new way. We don't like at times the situations we find ourselves in, but one of the things I have learned is that God will very often use my circumstance to change me, to do something for me and something in my life. I, I, I believe that God can do anything. I truly do. I'm one of these people who have such a trust in God. I, I, I love the Lord. I make no secret of that. And like Paul, I, I've often said, you know, I believe and truly do believe that I'm one of the worst people that could ever cry out to the Lord for salvation. I wasn't nice. I wasn't good. I didn't do good things. I didn't have a good background. I didn't come from a nice family. I didn't come from anything that, that made it good. I was a horrible person. But God said, I'm going to change your life. And he changed my life. And I do everything I can to walk in a way that's worthy of him. And I want you to know that God can do this and more in your life. The psalmist David knew who God was. And he had this confidence. I'm not talking about knowing about someone. I'm talking about actually knowing them. Whether you know whether you know, whether you know that the Lord loves you. I want to encourage you this day. I want to encourage you because the Lord has said, if you come to me, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll bring healing for the past and I'll give you a future. And I thank God for that. And I think that, thank God that Psalm 3 tells us that is the message of Psalm 3, that we, have a new, can, we can have a new beginning, we can have a new start. Whether you're old, whether you're young, it doesn't make any difference. I want to pray. I want to just close your eyes. Just Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you're going to move on every soul here, every person, Lord, that they may know, that they mo may know that you love them. So often, Lord, we come to you with questions and we say, Lord, if you love me so much, why did you let me get hurt? Or why did you let me hurt someone else? But I do believe that God says, I'm going to give you a new beginning. I'm going to do something in your life that only I can do. And if you're willing to trust God and allow God to do it, you will see things change. And God truly will give you beauty for ashes. 
the oil of joy for mourning. In other words, when you're down, it's going to lift you up. David might, may have been lamenting that he'd lost everything, but God restored everything to him. He restored his throne. He restored his family. He restored everything to him. And God is in the restoration business. He will restore, and he'll restore it better and greater than what it was before. Let's just, just take a moment just to ask the Lord just to, to work in your own life, not in your partner's life, not in your children's life, not in your parents' life, but in your life. Just ask him now, and God will hear your prayer. God will move on your behalf because he loves you. Amen. Amen. Okay.